Hi, my name is Father Mike Schmitz, and you're listening to the Bible in a Year podcast, where we encounter God's voice and live life through the lens of Scripture. The Bible in a Year podcast is brought to you by Ascension. Using the Great Adventure Bible Timeline, we'll read all the way from Genesis to Revelation, discovering how the story of salvation unfolds and how we fit into that story today. It is day 352. We are reading from the first letter of St. Peter, chapters 1 and 2, as well as the conclusion of St. Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapters 3 and 4. We're also reading from Proverbs, chapter 30, verses 10 through 14. As always, the Bible translation I'm reading from is the Revised Standard Version, Second Catholic edition. I'm using the Great Adventure Bible from Ascension. If you want to download your own Bible in a year reading plan, you can visit ascensionpress.com slash Bible in a year. You can also subscribe to this podcast by clicking on subscribe and receiving daily episodes and daily updates because today is day 352. We are reading 1 Peter chapters 1 and 2, Colossians chapter 3 and 4, as well as Proverbs chapter 30 verses 10 through 14. The first letter of Peter, chapter 1, Salutation. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, chosen and destined by God the Father and sanctified by the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. A Living Hope Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By His great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold which, though perishable, is tested by fire, may redound to praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Without having seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with unutterable and exalted joy. As the outcome of your faith, you obtain the salvation of your souls. The prophets who prophesied of the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired about this salvation. They inquired what person or time was indicated by the Spirit of Christ within them when predicting the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glory. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things which have now been announced to you by those who preach the good news to you through the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. A call to holy living. Therefore, gird up your minds, be sober, set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you invoke as father him who judges each one impartially according to his deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest at the end of the times for your sake. Through him, you have confidence in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere love of the brethren, love one another earnestly from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord abides forever. That word is the good news which was preached to you. Chapter 2 the living stone, and a chosen people. So, put away all malice and all guile and insincerity and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up to salvation. For you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Come to him, that living stone, rejected by men, but in God's sight chosen and precious. And like living stones, be yourselves built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and he who believes in him will not be put to shame. To you, therefore, who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the very stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that will make men stumble, a rock that will make them fall for they stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, that you may declare the wonderful deeds of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were no people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Live as servants of God. Beloved, I beg you as aliens and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh that wage war against your soul. Maintain good conduct among the Gentiles so that in case they speak against you as wrongdoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing right, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Live as free men, yet without using your freedom as a pretext for evil, but live as servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. The example of Christ's suffering. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to the kind and gentle, but also to the overbearing. For one is approved if, mindful of God, he endures pain while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you do wrong and are beaten for it, you take it patiently? But if, when you do right and suffer for it, you take it patiently, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. No guile was found on his lips. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he trusted to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. The Letter of Paul to the Colossians, Chapter 3 New Life in Christ If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you once walked when you lived in them. But now, put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and foul talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another seeing that you have put off the old man with his practices and have put on the new man who is being renewed in knowledge after the image of his creator. Here there cannot be Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, and patience, forbearing one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And over all these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Rules for Christian Households Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Slaves, Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever your task, work heartily as serving the Lord and not men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Chapter 4 Masters, treat your slaves justly and fairly knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Further Instructions 
continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And pray for us also, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear as I ought to speak. Conduct yourselves wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer everyone. Final Greetings and Benediction Tychicus will tell you all about my affairs. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts, and with him Onesimus, the faithful and beloved brother who is one of yourselves. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, receive him. And Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of yourselves, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always remembering you earnestly in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Heropolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Give my greetings to the brethren at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans. And see that you read also the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, See that you fulfill the ministry which you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. The book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verses 10 through 14. Do not slander a servant to his master, lest he curse you and you be held guilty. There are those who curse their fathers and do not bless their mothers. There are those who are pure in their own eyes, but are not cleansed of their filth. There are those, how lofty are their eyes, how high their eyelids lift. There are those whose teeth are swords, whose teeth are knives, to devour the poor from off the earth, the needy from among men. Father in heaven, we give you praise and glory. We thank you. Thank you so much for Paul. Thank you for Peter. Thank you for the gift of your son and the gift of your Holy Spirit that has guided um, the letters of these men as they give encouragement, so much encouragement to us as modern day Christians, just like they gave that word of encouragement to Christians of eras past and bygone years. Gosh, Lord, we think about this. We think about how for 2000 years, Christians have read these words of St. Peter, these words of St. Paul, and have found in them not only guidance and truth, but also just a word of encouragement and a word of, yeah, a word that just speaks into our pain and fills us with the capacity and that will to continue on, that will to endure, and that will not to merely endure, but the, the will to rejoice in the midst of suffering, in the midst of tribulation, because we know, Lord God, that it is only through the suffering that we can reach the kingdom of God. And so we ask you, please help us. Help us to say yes to you this day and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So we have the first letter of St. Peter, which is just ah, so grateful. Um, So some context for Peter's letter. He's writing to who? He's writing to exiles. Remember that there were a lot of Christians, Jewish Christians, who were exiled from Jerusalem during the persecution. And so it could be to them, but also could be to any Christians who find themselves in exile. And he says to the exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, um, that he's writing to them. They, they've experienced persecution. And this is so incredible because St. Peter jumps right in and he, and he says, in this you rejoice. What What is in this? Well, in this you, you've been born again. So chapter one, verse three, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So (laughs) this is this summary. I just invite you to go back to uh, chapter one, verses three, four, and five. This is the inheritance that's been given to us. This is the gift that Peter is reminding these Christians This is what you've been given. This is what the Lord God has done for you. Even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of suffering, this is what the Lord God has done for you. Because then he goes on to say in verse six, in this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, you may have to suffer various trials so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, which though perishable is tested by fire, may redound to praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
This is so important because he reminds them first of the gift they've been given. And then he tells them that what's going to happen is through this persecution, through this tribulation, through this trial, through this trouble, this is not God abandoning you. This is God doing something in you that he could not do without this trial, that he, that he could not do without this tribulation, that he could not do without these various trials. Because what's happening it is the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, which though perishable, is tested by fire, may redound to praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. One of the things that we know about the spiritual life is that, you know, a lot of times when people begin following the Lord, they can have this, this crisis. And the crisis is, um, many crises, of course, obviously all of us have, the, have them. But one of the crises can be that we know our hearts and we know that we have a mercenary heart. We know that I, Lord, am I only coming to you because you promised me eternal life? Am I only coming to you because of the graces that you give me in prayer? Am I only coming to you because of the gifts? I want to love you, the giver, but I know this about myself. I know that I love the gifts, maybe sometimes more than the giver. And so we have this, this, this mixed up motivation, right? We have this mercenary heart. That, you know, as C.S. Lewis has said, I think we've said this before, as C.S. Lewis has noted, I have a mercenary heart willing to give myself to the highest bidder, willing to give my heart to the highest bidder. And the question is, gosh, Lord, help me. How do I become the kind of person who can love you for your own sake? The answer is through trials and tribulations. And sometimes those trials and tribulations are like Peter's describing that would might end in martyrdom. But a lot of times those trials and tribulations are simply showing up when showing up is not glamorous. What I mean by that is it is pressing play on day 352 when, oh yeah, day one, day two, day 10, that was maybe kind of fun. Maybe got a lot out of it, but here's day 352 and you press play and say, okay, God speak, Lord speak. Your servant is listening. And it's like, well, this is dry. I didn't get a lot out of this. I was distracted by this. And sometimes when we show up for prayer, it's, that's all it is. It's just dry prayer. God is doing something in that maybe more than any other time. In fact, desolation and prayer can be used by the Lord God, maybe even more powerfully than consolation and prayer. Because what's happening in that desolation where we just show up and I get nothing out of this, what's God, what God is doing there is he is purifying our love for him. He is allowing us to go through this time of dry prayer, distracted prayer, and even desolate prayer so that we can have the kind of hearts that love him for his own sake. They don't just love the gifts, don't just love the consolations, don't just love the, those insights and blessings, but we love him. And here Peter is talking about this, you know, rejoice in this, rejoice um, in the various trials. Now, again, those are dramatic trials that many of them went through, but every Christian has to go through the normal trials of life so that our hearts and our love and our faith can be purified. He goes on to say, without having seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with unutterable and exalted joy. And this is what we, what we do as we do as well, is that we love the Lord God and he loves us. But that love gets purified through times of dryness, times of distraction, and times of desolation where we keep showing up. And that is so, so important. And of course, Peter goes on to talk about how we're called to live holy lives, that there's a way that we live life without Jesus and there's a way that we have to live life with Christ that he gave himself up for us. And so our call is to be holy as the Lord God is holy. Um, and he goes on to talk about how we are not only a new people, the living stones, chosen people, but he emphasizes in chapter two, verse nine, he says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. Once you were no people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And that, that reality, of course, from all nations, from all races, from all ethnicities, from all backgrounds, we are now gathered into one. And that's one of the reasons why as Christians, we, uh, gosh, the reality of uh, coming from different countries, speaking different languages, belonging to different races, all of those things are essentially nullified. Actually, I would say this, all of those are unified, maybe a better way to say it. All those are unified in the Lord Jesus, our most important identity, Peter is saying here, most important identity is that we are God's children. Therefore, our ethnicity, yeah, sure, that might be important, but not as important as being an adopted son or daughter of God. Our race, sure, that might be important, but not anywhere close to as important as being an adopted son or daughter of God. That, that <laughs> where our background as sinners in whatever way that we have sinned or continue to sin, whatever we struggle with, those things can be important, but they're nowhere near as important as the fact that you and I are now adopted sons and daughters of God the Father. 
So important. Uh, made into a royal priesthood. Remember <laughs> that Jesus Christ is the high priest. And he has made us into a nation of priests able to offer the sacrifice to the Father, which is just absolutely incredible. Last little note on St. Peter. When talking about um, being subject to every human institution, he's basically saying, live as great citizens, live as good citizens, and have that sense of order that's given to the world, whether that be to the emperor, to the governor, whoever that is. In families, um, husbands and wives have an obligation to each other. Parents and children have an obligation to each other. And even those you know, slaves and masters have an obligation to each other. Again, Maybe someone can distort this and say, no, 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 the men are over the women and the parents are over the kids and masters are over slaves. But that is not what St. Peter is saying. He is saying you have an obligation to each other. And that is absolutely, go back, please reread or re-listen to the end of chapter two. St. Peter is making a very, very clear point that all of us have an obligation to each other. That's one of the key pieces where... Um, St. Peter talks, in fact, uh, where Paul talks about this as well. And it's so interesting how in Colossians chapter three, St. Paul is making kind of some of the similar points. Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. This is the key. I remember I remember hearing this in, in mass at, when I was a kid growing up. The next line, which is chapter three, verse 20 of St. Paul's letter to the Colossians. Children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. And I remember being next to my dad and him looking over kind of a thing. And the next line is, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Like, yes, okay, there we go. I like that, Paul. I, I appreciate the The fact is not only did I feel myself justified in that moment in mass, but also what is Paul's point? Paul's point is you have an obligation to each other. You belong to each other. I think Mother Teresa once said, oh, if we have no peace, it's because we've forgotten that we belong to each other. That the wife, she belongs to her husband and the husband, he belongs to his wife. That the children, they belong to the parents and the parents, they belong to the children. And we belong to each other. And that is so critically important that we continue this way. And last little note, chapter four, as St. Paul leaves the Colossians here with his further instructions, chapter four, verse two, he says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And pray for us also, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. And this is so important, to pray for each other. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So important. Everything that Paul and Peter have written that we've heard declared today are absolutely critical for Christian living. And so, that's why we have to keep coming back to the word because it, right, it just goes sometimes in one ear and out the other. Sometimes it just washes over our heart and we just want to remember it. We want to store it up in our hearts. We want to have it carved into our hearts and it's so easy to forget. It's one of the reasons why it's so good to write these things down, whether that be in the insight journal or anywhere that you collect these gems, these pearls, these, these rules for living that we heard today from St. Peter and from St. Paul. It's a good day. Remember one of those, those uh, last rules for living is to pray steadfastly and to pray for each other. I am praying for you. Please, please pray for me. My name is Father Mike. I cannot wait to see you tomorrow. God bless. 